One of the greatest deceptions that Satan enjoys using is getting people to think that they are all alone in this world. Alone, going through the sufferings and the afflictions that they face and deal with on a daily basis. I'll say that Satan's been very successful at that. I've been asked many a times, what does the Bible have to say about depression? Well, the Bible has quite a bit to say about it. But for me personally, I'd say the best evidence or example that we see of someone going through a state of depression, with the exception of Job, is Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19, where he felt like he was all alone. When loneliness resides within the heart of an individual, soon depression begins to take hold of him or her. But however, God provided a solution for Elijah's depression. And what is that solution? Well, I encourage you all to join back with us this evening at 5 o'clock to find out what the solution that God had for Elisha and to overcome his depression in 1 Kings chapter 19. So I encourage you to please come back and join us this afternoon slash evening at 5 o'clock where we worship and glorify God again in spirit and in truth and to listen to another message from his holy word. However, this morning, this morning's message definitely goes hand in hand correlates with tonight's message. One of the great themes throughout the Bible is that Jesus offers us release of the burdens of life. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30, Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavily burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you shall find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Notice what Jesus had said. His burden is light. Meaning that although his burden is light, active discipleship means that there's still going to be burdens that we have to carry and that we have to face on a day-to-day -day basis. According to 2 Corinthians, the true disciple understands and knows that the total job description of true discipleship, of being a servant of Christ, is knowing that you are going to have burdens that you're going to have to face and carry. Some of the burdens at times seem to be so heavy. When Paul was challenged, to prove that he was of Christ or that he was a Christian, he told of his labors, his toils, his griefs, his pains, and his persecutions. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 through 29. He spoke about his sleepless nights that he had over a troublesome church and all the dealings and all the troubles that Corinth was dealing with. He said that there are times when I could not sleep at night because of my anxieties, my concerns over not just the church at Corinth, but over all the churches. He experienced grief caused by brethren who seemed to have turned their backs on him. After bringing them to the gospel, after building genuine relationships with them, out of nowhere, all these false accusations and these false rumors are going against Paul. And it seems that the brethren at Corinth believed those false accusations, and they turned their backs on Paul. We read that in chapter 2, verse 1 through 4 of 2 Corinthians. But in one particular statement, vivid statement, I should say, Paul tells of a persecution so severe, so heavy, that he was heavily burdened, excessively burdened, utterly burdened beyond his strength, and that he got to a point where he despaired life itself. Chapter 1, verse 8 of 2 Corinthians. The opening section of 2 Corinthians, if you have your Bibles, please, I encourage you to open them to 2 Corinthians. Because the opening section of chapter 1 is filled with this theme. Now, in verse 1 and 2, Paul's wishful greeting is a prayer request for God's grace and the enjoyment of peace. 
Paul indicates that both elements, the grace and peace, come from a single source, God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Only by receiving God's undeserved gifts can a person truly experience peace in their life. And this is the peace of shalom in Hebrew, meaning that it is the peace that prevails when God is our friend and that all is well. Verse 2 is such a beautiful opening with what Paul is now about to discuss in verses 3 through 11. And what is he about to discuss? Well, if I were to summarize it in one big main idea, if you're to leave here this morning, when you are a person who is feeling like you are heavily burdened with whatever it is that you are going through, whatever affliction, suffering, hardship that you are dealing with, this message is for you. Maybe those right now who are not feeling burdened, maybe things are going very well in your life. Well, this is a great reminder for you still in case if later in the future you start to have heavy burdens that come into your life. This is a great message for you as well. It's a great message for all of God's people. And it's the message that God comforts the heavy burden. God comforts the heavy burden. And when we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 through 11, we're going to look at three specific areas that Paul is going to focus on concerning about God comforting the heavy burden. He begins in verse 3 and the first part of verse 4 by sharing what the source of all comfort is. What is the power source that provides and gives us comfort whenever we are feeling heavily burdened or whenever we are going through affliction, sufferings, hardships, hurtful times, whatever it may be, what is our power source? Well, Paul says the power source is none other than the Father of our Lord Jesus, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Notice the three descriptions that God has to say, excuse me, that Paul has to say about God being the source and why he's the source of all comfort. The first description is that it's because he is the Father of our Lord Jesus. He begins by saying, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus. You know, just as Job responded to the pains of his life in Job chapter 1, verse 21, blessed be the name of the Lord. He gives and takes away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. Just as Job declared that statement through his pains and through his toils and through the sufferings of his life, Paul as well opens his account of his burdens with the words of thanksgiving to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's important for us to understand because just as Satan tempted our Lord Jesus Christ, Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 11, Luke chapter 4, verse 1 through 13, Satan likewise will do the best he can to make our lives as miserable as possible. He'll do everything in his limited power to bring you down, to put the pressures of life, to burden you, overburden you, where you are beyond your own strength, to bring you down and away from Jesus Christ. Satan is a ferocious dragon, raging war with those who keep the commandments of our Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. Who are those that keep the commandments of our Lord Jesus Christ? You and I. He is going to attack us from all angles of life. Through our children, maybe through our wife, maybe through our husband, maybe through our sons and daughters, through family members, through our health, through our jobs, through our government, through our education system, through our erring brothers and sisters, and the list goes on. He's going to do whatever he can. He tempted the Lord Jesus He's going to tempt you and I. Notice the second description that Paul gives about God. He's the father of mercies. Now, we talked a lot about mercy in our Bible classes, have we not? 
Mercy, best definition of it, is giving something to someone that they cannot give to themselves. What was interesting is that this Greek word for mercy is different from Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. This Greek word for mercy is very unique because it's only used five times in the New Testament scriptures. And the general meaning of this word refers to all types and acts of compassion. What I find interesting is the origin of this word that's being used here. Because it describes the emotional and grieving side of a person. Ancient people would use this word as a label to someone who has lost the most precious and valuable thing in their life. What is the most valuable and precious thing in our life that would cause a person so much grief? How about losing your loved one? A person loses a loved one and grieves day and night with heavy emotional cries. Who else to better understand what it feels like to lose the most precious thing in your life than the Father of mercies who gave the most precious thing that he had, his son, Jesus Christ. That is why he's the Father of mercies. If you think that you're alone and nobody understands about losing a loved one, whether it be your spouse, whether it be your own son or daughter, think about God. Where was God at when my son or my daughter or my spouse died? God was right where he was at when his son died. He's the father of mercies. And when we have the right understanding of him being the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of mercies, we can then conclude that he certainly is the God of all comfort. That is the third description that Paul uses about God being the source of all comfort. It's because he is the God of all comfort. Now, the word comfort is found at least 10 times in chapter 1 alone. In fact, the word appears more in 2 Corinthians than it does in all of the other epistles that Paul wrote combined. It is no accident that the words about divine comfort appear most often in the one letter where Paul speaks in the most detail about his afflictions for the sake of Jesus Christ. Paul can withstand the affliction because God comforts us in all of our affliction. His heavy burdens were never carried alone. In any tragic moment, only God himself can bring comfort to your life. In one of the most beautiful passages of Scripture, God speaks to his desolate people saying, Comfort, oh comfort my people. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1 and 2. So when Paul describes God as being the God of all comfort, he is recalling the history of his people. God had not prevented the pains that his people had to go through in the Old Testament. But he had been the God of comfort. See, in the Bible, comfort is not just, it's more than a kind word or a uh, a perfect tranquilizer. God's comfort is his power to strengthen and to save his people, his children. The meaning is suggested when the prophet addresses a despairing people in Isaiah chapter 54, verse 11, where he says, O afflicted one, stormed, tossed, and not comforted. Then later on in Isaiah 57, verse 18, he says, I will lead and restore comfort to him. Folks, if we wonder how Paul was able to endure the burdens which his faith brought him, the answer is found in his view of who God is. Why is it that Paul was able to bring his burdens and his pains and his hardships first to God? It's because he had the proper view of who God is. And folks, if we today can understand and have that proper view just as Paul did, and knowing who the source of all comfort is, of who God is, Father of our Lord Jesus, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, if we can have that proper view just as Paul did, 
God will be that first person that we go to seeking the comfort that we need to overcome any afflictions and sufferings and turmoils that we deal with throughout this life. The second area that Paul brings to our attention in the text, verses 4 through 7, is that there's a sharing of this comfort as well. God gives his divine comfort to people who are afflicted, to his people specifically who are afflicted. But that's not it. There's a purpose behind it. There's a purpose to why we are afflicted. There's a purpose to why we suffer and have hardships. And there's a purpose why God gives his comfort. And that purpose is to share it with one another. That reason stated right there. So that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. The purpose of benefiting from God's comfort is so that we may be able to comfort others. It is only when we have been comforted by God, we then have the power. Is that word able in the text? That Greek word is where we get our English word for dynamite. It's the same word that's used in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Regarding the power of the gospel, when God comforts us, we then have the power to be able to comfort others in the affliction that they are going through. And that Greek word affliction simply means a downward pressure, a downward pressure. When the difficulties of life seem to pile on us, we are pressed down suffocating as if we can't breathe. Well, it is through the power of comfort that said pressure is then removed, allowing the afflicted to breathe and bear the affliction without fainting or passing out or giving up. I'm going to help lighten the load for you, brother. I'm going to help lift and carry this burden with you, sister. Why is it that we help lighten the load for others? Verse 5 is the answer. Because as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. That word abundantly is suggesting the idea of overflowing. The image of overflowing suggests that the church is a community where no man is isolated on an island all by himself. Our burdens overflow from one to another. In the same way, there is a sharing and an overflowing of comfort as well. Paul knows that he is not the only one who has been desperate. Others share the same sufferings as he has suffered. Emotional sufferings, mental sufferings, physical sufferings, emo uh, spiritual sufferings. Surely others would benefit from a sharing of the strength which he has received from God. And folks, when we are sharing one another's burdens, when we are sharing the comforts that God has comforted us with, what's the result? Well, Paul says, here's the result of it all. Verse 6 and 7, he goes on to say, If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. In other words, what Paul is saying is that the spiritual well-being of his fellow brothers and sisters in Christ was so important to him. What kept Paul refusing to give up was their salvation, was their faithfulness. Because think about it, if he were to give up, then what would the other Christians think? Paul, who was a chosen apostle, chosen by Jesus himself, gave up. If it didn't mean anything for Paul, then I guess it doesn't mean anything for me. If it wasn't important for Paul, then it's probably not going to be important for me. Paul didn't want that to happen. He did not want his fellow brothers and sisters, whom he brought to the gospel, whom he loved dearly, he did not want them to give up. And he knew that if he were to give up, they would too. If 
we stood alone with our burdens, we might easily be crushed. But we are strengthened by others in the church whose past experiences give us hope. It is the attitude of, if he can overcome it, then I can overcome it. If brother so-and-so was able to overcome this, I know I can too. If he was strengthened by God to beat this trial, to beat this affliction, then so can I. If he can remain faithful, I know I can too. God's comfort comes to us through others. If we see ourselves afflicted, we need those who can share with us the comfort with which they have received from God. It is finding a brother or sister that you know who went through the same thing that you're currently going through, sitting down and asking him or her, how is it that God got you through this? I need to know. Because the way that God got you through this can be the same way I can get through it as well. So how did you get through it? How did God help you through it? That's the idea right here. The burden of one may finally serve a useful purpose in the whole church. Folks, that's why we suffer. That's why there's affliction. And that's why God gives us comfort. There's a purpose behind it so that we can share it with one another. Paul then, verse 8 through 11, shares his own personal experience. He says, let me give you a personal experience, for example, on how the strength of God's comfort came to me during my most needed and desperate time. Verse 8 through 11, he says, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, of the affliction that we experienced in Asia. For we were so heavily burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received a sentence of death that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer, so that you will give thanks on our behalf for the blessings granted to us through the prayers of men. The experience that Paul shared was an affliction that became such a heavy burden that he thought all hope was lost that he thought that this was the end of his life, that this was it. Death is right in front of me. And I despair of life itself. Paul was heavily burdened. And most certainly it does not take much time before outward affliction starts crushing the person's inner will and inner spirit to keep on fighting. I'm sure we've witnessed and we see it throughout the hospitals, do we not? Patients who are terminally ill, fighting for their life, years they've been fighting, years and years, and then they finally got to a point where they said, I'm done fighting. I just want it to stop. That's where Paul was at. Paul says, I'm just about done fighting. I just want it to all stop and end. And some of you may be wondering why I have this picture of a overloaded cargo ship that's tipping over and falling into the river. Well, it's because that is where this word despair comes from. The Greek word that's used for despair is the idea of a cargo ship that has been overloaded. And all of the burdens of ministry were overloading his capacities to carry them. And it just seems as if he was drowning. This has happened many times with cargo ships. It still happens today. People don't know when to stop loading it and save it for the next cargo ship. They overload it. And when they get about halfway to their destination, sure enough, 
That ship says, that's all that I can handle. And it tips over. Isn't that how life is sometimes? Sometimes we don't know when to say, stop loading. Stop loading. And I preach it to myself. <laughs> stop loading yourself. Because you're about to tip over, fall over, and drown. The experience, though, gave Paul the perspective which led him to describe God as the one who comforts us in all of our affliction. In the moment of despair, Paul learned to rely on God's resurrection power and not on his own strength and his own power. Paul is thinking, hold on, wait a minute. Why am I feeling like this? You know, even if I were to die, God would have the power to raise me from the dead if he so wishes. And isn't that the kind of faith that the Hebrew writer talked about that Abraham had in Hebrews chapter 11? On why he was able to actually go through with the commandment to sacrifice his only son, Isaac? Now, it didn't happen because it was a test, but how? How would a father be able to go through with it? The Hebrew writer tells us because Abraham had the faith in knowing that God had the power to raise his son from the dead if God wanted to. And here's the thing, folks. God is going to raise us from the dead. If it's our time to go, Paul says those who are dead in Christ, who passed on to their eternal reward, those who are dead in Christ, when Christ comes back, they will be the first one to rise. It was the resurrection power of God that gave Paul that faith and that hope and that encouragement to keep on keeping on in his affliction. God's comfort was not limited to kind words. It was the power which delivered Paul from a deadly peril and gave him the strength to continue his ministry. Now, again, I know I've kind of been bringing to your attention some interesting facts about certain Greek words because it's fascinating, and I believe it certainly makes the point more powerful when I bring it to your attention. And here's another one. This word deliver that is used here is an ancient term. Once again, we have another ancient term. And this word was used to describe the stones that would be placed around a person's grave. Big stones that would be placed there. And these stones were used around the graves to keep from certain predators to come in, disturbing the peace. Likewise, God, who is our stone of help, 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12, circled his divine protection and comfort around Paul to rescue him and to keep out the affliction that was trying to disrupt the peace. Now, even though throughout this lesson so far, we have brought to our attention some very powerful lessons and I would say minor applications to our life, but I save the major applications toward the end of this lesson. What about our experience? Paul shared his experience of a time when he was heavily burdened, where he was about to give up. But then he also shared about how God came to comfort him. What about our experience? When we're heavily burdened, how might God come to us and give us his comfort? Well, there's three major things. I would say, well, not things, but ways on how God can give and provide his comfort to us. The first one is that God can comfort us with his presence through the written word. Since we have the completed word of God, we have access to countless examples of men and women who may relate to what others have gone through or still going through. Here are a few examples. A mother who has lost her newborn child, or who was a stillborn, can relate to the grieving of Bathsheba. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 24. A husband who unexpectedly loses his wife can relate with Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 24, verse 15 through 18. A husband who is grieving over his wife leaving him for another man can relate with Hosea, Hosea chapter 2, verse 2. 
or maybe perhaps a single parent who's been left to raise their children all by his or herself can also relate with Hosea. A church that grieves over the loss of a godly spiritual leader can relate to Israel's grief. Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 8. Or a wife who is starting to have maybe perhaps fears or doubts in the marriage can relate with the Shulamite woman in Song of Solomon. A suffering Christian who feels like they just want to give up all through the sufferings and afflictions that they're dealing with can relate with Asaph in Psalm chapter 73. They can relate with Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8 through 10. Folks, the list goes on. God's word is filled with examples of godly men and women who have suffered in life that we can relate to and with. Secondly, God comforts us by the presence of fellow Christians. Many times, Christians do not go to the aid of fellow brothers and sisters in deep distress because they do not know what to say. Well, here's the thing. Most of the times, you don't have to say anything. Just being there, your presence being there by their side is powerful enough to give them strength that they need. Now, I hope that you picked up some of those handouts back there because those handouts that I put back there, there's two of them that give you some good practical suggestions and advice. One of them is the do's and do not forget and never for when you are trying to comfort someone who's in affliction. And then there's also practical suggestions for those who are, cert- that are currently going through afflictions right now. What you can do to help you overcome these afflictions and sufferings. And I encourage you, please grab those handouts. They're very helpful. But oftentimes, when we are comforting our fellow brothers and sisters, our presence is a powerful comfort to those who have suffered severe illness or any type of affliction. There's a story of an 85-year-old Christian man. The church that he was a member of, a sister in Christ had lost her husband. She was married to him for 55 years. Well, at the gravesite service, it was over 100 degrees. There's no canopy. The crowds dispersed. They went home. The widow wife stayed there at the gravesite. But there was still one brother there. The 85-year-old brother in Christ. When other members of the church saw that, they told him, saying, look, a man of your condition, of your age, you don't need to be out in over 100 degree weather. Well, he turned and looked at them and said, no one should have to go through that kind of a burden all alone. He didn't say anything. All he did was he stood there at the gravesite with them. did not say a word. Your presence is a powerful comfort enough for those who are going through any type of severe affliction. Lastly, we see, according to verse 11 of 2 Corinthians 1, God comforts us through the prayers of the church. No congregation of the Lord's church will ever be mightier than the prayer lives of its people. Therefore, it ought to be important for brothers and sisters to pray with each other, especially when one is suffering. Folks, God... Yes, comforts the heavy burden. And there are many other things that we could possibly share from this lesson as well. But I think this would be enough for us to understand that God comforts the heavy burden. He comforts us and he has a purpose behind it so that we can be able to comfort others. God shares his comfort through his written word. God shares his comfort through one another. And God shares his comfort through the prayers of the church family as well. God may not offer a tranquilizer to remove us from the anxiety of the ministry that we are going through, the ministry of Christianity, but he sends comfort to us in many ways. So set your hope in him. You know, we offer the invitation, and I always make sure to inform people that the invitation is used for three particular ways. One for those who've never obeyed the gospel, gives them the opportunity to obey it now. 
For a brother or sister who needs to confess and repent of sins, the opportunity is there. And thirdly, the opportunity is also, if you are just needing prayers from your church family for comfort, for strength to overcome whatever affliction that you are dealing with, that opportunity is there right now. If you have any need, please, I encourage you to come forward together as we stand and as we sing.